Welcome to the Old Westbury Seventh-day Adventist Church. Happy Sabbath. We pray that you had a good week, and we are thankful that you have jo chosen to join us for the Choice of Life study of our Sabbath School lesson, lesson number eight here, going through the book of Deuteronomy. I know I enjoyed going through the lesson, and I believe you will be blessed this morning also. We want to thank you for tuning in. We want to encourage you to share the link with your family and friends. If you have opportunity, go to our YouTube page channel, hit subscribe, and then you can share with others. We have our sermons there, our prayer meeting there, Sabbath school, all of these different ministries we have available on our YouTube channel. So we want to encourage you to view those and share them with others as you're able to. But this morning, we're ready to do our lesson. For those who don't have one, you can go to our website, Old Westbury Seventh-day Adventist Church, and you'll see the lessons there, and you can download them so you can follow along. We want to encourage you to share your questions and comments online, and we'll get to those as, as soon as we can. Remember, there's about a, a 20, 30-second delay between what you're hearing and then what we're getting uh, responses, so we'll try to keep those in connection with the flow of the lesson. So thank you so much for being with us today. We want to have a prayer and then we'll get started today. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity on this beautiful Sabbath morning to come into your presence and to worship you and to study from the book of Deuteronomy. We want to ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out. Bless those viewing online. Bless those who are watching here in the sanctuary. Be with our teacher today. Be with Elder Santiago as he guides us and encourages us and uh, helps us through this lesson. Bless as only you can, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, welcome. Thank you for being with us. God bless. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Thank you, Pastor, for that uh, introduction and for the opening prayer. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath to those who are watching online. I hope you woke up nice and early. It's a beautiful fall day. Uh, the sunshine is still well, even though it's a crisp morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a blessing to be here studying God's word. And as we uh, are going through this journey through the book of Deuteronomy. I'm really enjoying this lesson, and this week's lesson was no different. Um, I love the title of the lesson, Choose Life, and we talk about there's just so much doctrine, just in those two, two words, choose life. We're on lesson number eight. Our memory text is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, and it says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. What a beautiful word that Moses speaks to the nation of Israel just as they're about to enter into the promised land. Moses lays it out pretty, pretty finely, and he uses such words that are just so poetic in the book of Deuteronomy. And we're going to study more about the um, coming verses that, that uh, um, accompany that, that scripture reading. If you have questions, if you have comments, feel free to post them. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary, feel free to raise your hand and, and um, share your comments, share your thoughts, share a question if you have one as we go through the lesson. Um, I always enjoy teaching for that reason because I also learn as I teach, and it's a blessing to study the word together. We'll run through our lesson through the quarterly. Um, this week's lesson, uh, Moses offered two paths to Israel, one leading to life and another one leading to death. As you look at that PowerPoint, I love that, that image there. You see the man standing and there's two pathways and one, one to the right looks, I would have put it on the reverse. I would think the right pathway would have been the right pathway as the left pathway would have been the bad pathway. But when you look at the, the image, it's like a clear distinction that we oftentimes, every day, every week, every month, we come to crossroads in our lives where we have to make a decision each and every day, morning, noon, and night. Every day we are faced with decisions that we have to make. And our decisions, what we decide to do, whether we go to the left or whether we go to the right, is going to have a profound effect on our day, on our week, may even affect our salvation because we have to know that we have to, be choose, we have to choose wisely in everything that we do. I think it's in somewhere in Isaiah where, where it talks about the Holy Spirit, that you will hear a voice behind you telling you, go this way or go that way. 
And that's what we need to, that's why we, it's so important that we stay in constant communion with the Lord. First thing in the morning, we should open our day up with prayer, making sure, dedicating our whole day to God in prayer, saying, God, direct my path today. Help me to make wise choices. Help me to make wise decisions. And when we start our day off like that, you'll see that the difference in the day, you know, when you start your day off without prayer, you are in for some, for some stuff, I'm telling you. Because if you start the day off without seeking God first and laying, letting him direct your path, you're going to come into some difficult decisions. And Satan is there waiting. He knows that if he can get you to neglect prayer, he's got you right where he wants you. Because prayer is that communication and that constant um, communion with God. Do we have some options, the same options today? Is there a third or fourth option? Is it important to make a decision, or can we just go with the flow? We oftentimes hear that, just go with the flow, and that's kind of like the attitude, um, not to pick on the young people, but that's, yeah, you know, you get young, you get careless, you think that you're invincible, you think you can do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. Um, it's my life, I'll live it the way I want to, I'll, I'll live um, according to my own choices. The message in Deuteronomy is very clear. The most important piece of advice for us was given by God through Moses, therefore, choose life. And you think about just those two words, choose life, there's so much biblical doctrine just in that because so much of the Christian world does not believe in the ability of us to choose, to choose our own salvation, to choose to be lost or to choose to be saved. I oftentimes, and I've asked this question many times before, as a teacher and, and also in some of my sermons, is, is it easier to be saved or is it easier to be lost? Is it easier to be saved or is it easier to be lost? And, and I'm not talking about the Christian experience, whether it's hard or whether it's easy. I'm talking about, from a God's perspective, is it easier to be saved or easier to be lost? You gotta think about what you need to do in order to be lost, right? You would have had to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. You would have had to turn away his voice. You would have had to neglect the Holy Spirit who was constantly chasing, trying to convict you, trying to bring you to repentance. You would have to work and work and work. The wages of sin is death. How do you earn wages? You work. You gotta work to sin and die. The gift of God is eternal life through just Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. We, don't ha we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do. If it was something that we did that got us God's grace, that got us that gift of eternal life, then it wouldn't be a gift anymore. But God says, I give it to you freely. So it's as simple as that. Choose life or choose death. And as this lesson really hammers home that point, um, that leaves no doubt with regards to, is it easier to be saved or to be lost? Sunday's lesson was entitled The Tree of Life. We're going to talk about the Tree of Life both in paradise and where is it now. Is there another Tree of Life? Monday, no middle ground. Um, Tuesday's entitled Life and Death, Life and Good, Death and Evil, Blessings and Cursings. Wednesday was entitled Not Too Hard for You. And Thursday's lesson was A Question of Worship. What's the difference between existence and life? What's the difference between existence and life? Are they the same thing? No, what's the difference? Someone, someone who's a philosopher? I, I hate to get philosophical on you, but think. What's the difference between existence and life? Anyone dare to uh, tackle that, that difficult question, Elder Day Allen? I, I see you no, reaching it's, uh, it's For example, we take rock, right? It is an existence. It will be an existence. We don't know until the earth, until Jesus comes or the rock is going to be. The life is different because it is once certain age after that or certain things, we are going to die. Yeah. So that is the difference. It's you did your lesson and you used the, 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 exact less, the, the exact example that the lesson pointed out. Rock, did you have a comment in the back, Caesar? Did you also have your hand up? Wait for, the, wait for the mic so that the people online can also hear, you, hear your question or your comment. We want to... You know, the different, like, uh, a stone and a person, one mm -hmm. half is rental life, the other one half. Mm -hmm. But both exist, we can see. Yeah. So the, the rock exists, right? Did the rock choose to exist? No. Did it have a say in it? Did we have a say in our existence? No. Did you say to your mother or to your father, bear me now? 
I want to be born in the year 1973 or 19, you know, whatever it may be. So we look at that as an example, okay? A rock has existence, we have existence. The rock does not have life, we have life. What's that? Uh -huh. Life testifies existence, good comment, yes. Now we think about an animal. What's the difference between an animal and us in terms of existence and life? Just those two things for now. Yes, uh, Dr. Mangela. So we are created in the image of God and we have um, free will. We've been given the moral um, ability to make the choice, the free will. The animals don't have that. Yes, very good. And so we talk about a rock, we talk about the animals, and we talk about humans. There's existence, there's life, and there's free will. Now, what about the angels? Do they have all three? They, have free will. they, they do have free they will. They do have free will. What do we have that the angels do not have? Procreation. I heard you say it, Dylan. I think human is a procreation. I think uh, uh, angels, they don't have that one. In a special sense, we are just like God in the fact that we can recreate in our own image. When we, um, through the marriage union, which is the only union sanctified by God to, to reproduce, okay, God said be fruitful and multiply, right? That was the blessing that he bestowed upon Adam and Eve. Now, the angels, they, they are neither given in marriage, they do not marry, nor are they given in marriage. So in a special sense, we have that extra gift that God gave us. Now, you think about this free will, this free choice, and this is gonna take us right into the into Sunday's lesson, the tree of life. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. Now, the existence of the tree of life proves that we were designed to live forever. It was God's intent that we should live forever. But by Adam and Eve's choice to not obey God and to follow the dictates of their own heart and listen to the serpent rather than to God, they, that sin, that condemnation fell upon all of us. So we are no longer designed or able to live forever in this mortal human being life that we have. There are many different types of living beings on earth, but only humans can make moral decisions. God didn't give the animals the ability to choose which food they could eat. However, he forbade humans from eating a specific food and told them about the consequences of disobeying. Adam and Eve chose death, they disobeyed and lost access to the tree of life. Now, we talk about the tree of life. Where is it right now? Does it still exist? It's in heaven where specifically, do we know? I don't know. You remember, it was in one of those revelation, it was in one of the seven churches of Revelation, Revelation chapter two, verse seven. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 22, verse two, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each fruit yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22 first, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So where is the tree of life? In paradise, in the city of God. Sister White's first vision, she had a vision of the tree of life. Anybody know what it looks like? Wow, shock, nobody. <laughs> Somebody, okay. She saw in vision the tree of life. This is taken from early writings. This is one of her first visions that she received from the Lord. Here we saw the tree of life and the throne of God. Out of the throne came a pure river of water, and on either side of the river 
was the tree of life. How many trunks did the tree of life have? Two trunks on either side of the river, joined into the middle as though they were almost two trees, but yet they were one tree. Anyone know what it looked like? What the color of it is? On one side of the river was a trunk of a tree and a trunk on the other side of the river, both of pure, transparent gold. Can you vision that? Pure, transparent, a tree made of pure, transparent gold. Talk about the fruit that hang from it. You know what they're made out of, what they look like, what she said they look like? Its branches bowed to the place where we stood, and the fruit was glorious. It looked like gold mixed with silver. Ooh, I want to eat that fruit. Can you imagine what that tastes like? The branches bowing from the weight of these fruit that she saw in this river, this tree of life. So it was God's original design that we should live forever. And in the earth made new and in the kingdom made new and in paradise, we will eat from the tree of life and we will live forever. Choose life. We're going to hear that and constantly repeat it. God intervened to avoid leaving the fate of humanity to the consequence of that decision. He conceived a plan to give access to the tree of life through Jesus. Why did God block access to the tree of life after Adam and Eve sinned? Yes, Mangela. So I have a question going Go back to the tree of life, um, if you may. Uh, so after the New Jerusalem comes down to the earth, would the tree of life be in New Jerusalem? My understanding is that the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life and all that existed in Eden is going to be in that city. Come back to the earth. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. That's going to be the central look, focal point of where worship is going to occur. Because when you, talk, when, you, when you study about the Garden of Eden, that word garden, it's similar to like a tabernacle where everyone, it was the meeting place. It was a special place where God would have one-on-one -on -one communication with his people. So in the same instance, that city of God that is going to come down, the New Jerusalem is going to be the, uh, the, the center, of the, the, the tabernacle basically where everyone goes to worship. Okay. The answer to the second question, um, God took away the tree of life because he didn't want man to eat of that and be wicked forever and ever. Yes, and be eternal, everlasting sinners, right? They, they were sinned, they were in a sinful fallen state, so they were now cast out from, from the Garden of Eden and from eating the tree of life. Yes, Diane. Yeah, it's a... Uh, uh, Tree of Life, uh, what you said, in addition to that, I would like to read from Sister White. After the entrance of sin, the heavenly husbandman transplanted, transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above. But its branches hang over the wall to the lower world. Through the redemption purchased by the blood of Christ, we may still eat of its life-giving fruit. Yes, yes, and that's salvation through Jesus yeah. Christ, and that there's no other way. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Can you break it down any more simpler than that? Is there any other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved? Right? It's pretty clear. The Bible is pretty clear, and yet we have so much false doctrine out there with regards to um, the ways of salvation and that there's many rivers that lead to the same ocean and that there's other ways to be saved and that there's oh no the, it makes it clear he who has the son has life he who does not have the son of god does not have life so what about those people um let's go back in time who never heard the name of jesus how would they be saved will they be saved i I think it's uh, whatever the uh, light they had it. For example, you can take in the uh, people in the forest, those who leave, what uh, they never know about Jesus. But God gave them the knowledge or wisdom or light, whatever, based on the nature or whatever the things he's going to decide based on that. Yeah, and even if when you go through the Bible, through the patriarchs and the prophets, they didn't fully understand the plan of salvation. They didn't fully understand the death. They, they understood that a redeemer would come. They didn't know Jesus to be the, 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 the redeemer of all mankind, per se, as much as we understand it, which is that we've been given so much greater light in terms of the plan of salvation than, than, than they had. They longed to look for that day, the Bible says, right? They looked forward to that day. And those 
who have never heard of the name of Jesus, in that same context, they can look through nature. Nature shows that there was a creator. You know, and, and Paul talks about it in Romans, about there was no excuse that you could look and see that none of this came about by its own, by its own, own power. Yes, Pastor. All right, so uh, we have a question here going back to the statement made about if they had eaten of the tree of life, become immortal sinners. So we have a question here from uh, Rachel it says, would Adam and Eve still be alive today had they eaten of the tree of life? Would they still be alive today? Well, had it been permitted by God? Yes, sure, anything's possible, but God's word was clear. The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That is what God stated, and that was the death sentence was pronounced upon them. He could have struck them dead right then and there, but yet they saw that they were under the condemnation of the penalty of death, and they, 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 they talk about Eve in the Garden of Eden when she saw the first leaf wither and die. And she saw, that was the first time she saw the consequences of her sin. They said that she weeped, Sister White describes her weeping much more than we would weep for a loved one today. As though we had lost a brother, a mother, a sister, a father, and you weep and you mourn. That was the sorrow that Eve felt of the consequences of her own sin. And seeing that first leaf, that beautiful leaf that was so green and vibrant, turn brown, turn yellow, turn red. I mean, we enjoy the colors now in the fall, but when you think about that penalty, the actions that you cause now, the roses are starting to grow thorns, the bushes are starting to grow briars, and the, 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 the rocks, the cliffs, everything's starting to become jagged. The, the air is starting to have a poison of sin on it. The animals are now starting to die. This constant, constant reminder of over, over 900 years of the penalty of her sin, that, that, that regret, that sorrow for sin definitely existed. Yes, yes, John. Just wanted to say, um, you, you can think on, of terms of metaphoric um, um, procedure on, 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 on the side of God uh, with the creation of the tree of life. Um, because if you think about pure gold, that means perfection. Mm. And um, I think in a way, uh, it means uh, plentitude. And uh, it also goes back a little bit to the greedy part, the greediness of, of human nature. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have. Uh, and and, and, and um, getting that hand to put it on the fruit, which as you said, as we know, it's silver and gold. And why silver and gold, right? Mm. So these are a few things that we can think about when we look at the tree of life. Um, on the other hand, the question somebody had about um, uh, the people, like you said, in the jungles, deep in the jungles of the earth, um, that do, don't know, uh, don't know God. Um, there is, um, if you think about, let's say, 1492, when uh, Christopher Columbus discovered the New World, right, and getting the shores of what we have today in Dominican Republic. Um, and also in the jungles, uh, you know, in, in, in Middle America, right? Uh, on the things that he goes so far to find, like part of Panama. Um, you know, the, the indigenous people, just as they saw the Spaniards on the shores, they bow down instantly. So uh, we know that everybody's going to see God. So, uh, you know, the, the submission and obedience of those that believe and wait for would be right away. So yeah. think you're, about those times. Your history teacher is coming out in you. <laughs> no, just, actually, I'm a Spanish teacher. <laughs> well, the teacher in general. Um, I hope that answered your question, Rachel, with regards to living forever. God said that the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There was no ambigu ambiguity there. Um, devil, in fact, tried to twist those words and said that you shall not surely die, uh, that you will live forever. Um, the Bible presents only two options. We can only choose between life and death. Um, on Monday's lesson, they go through a, a series of different Bible verses that clearly point out that there's only two options. There's no middle ground. There's no uh, part of being life and death. We have a choice to make. Now, with regards to those who choose, right, 
Um, I talked about that illustration in the beginning, that opening slide where we talk about two pathways. Jesus talked about two pathways, right? What two pathways did he talk about? Matthew seven thirteen, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go therein at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be there that find it. Will there be more saved or more lost? Will there be more saved or more lost? Don't know. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. I see Mangelan and the pastor. Go ahead. I think many will be lost because many are going to travel that broad road. Very few are going to choose that narrow path. Mm. Um, you know, we, we don't know a number. We don't. Uh, we know this. Isaiah 53 says, And he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. In other words, you shall see the, those that are saved and be satisfied. In the context of, praise the Lord for these are the ones who have made it. God will always carry a... a, a a heavy heart for the lost, you know, the lost angels, all of those. He'll carry heavy heart. But we don't know. We don't know if there's a 50-50, 80-20, what it is. We don't know. What yeah. we want to do is make sure that we're saved and by God's grace save all that we can. Yeah, and to give you, to give you hope, uh, David, you have a comment as well? No, I agree with everyone's comments. and uh, I don't want to delve into it, but I'm, I always have that notion of what he says, just like in the days of Noah. When I think of that, I say that's kind of a slim number. <laughs> the whole world was mm -hmm. evaporated, if you want to say it like that. But hopefully that we all could take the heat of his warning. Not the heat of a warning, but warning of the lake of fire, but at least receive God and find his way, find the way that he's talking about. What is God's will for your life? Salvation. Is God willing that any should perish? God, is, God wants everyone to be saved. The, the choice is yours. Whether we choose to live or choose to die is ours, okay? He, his will is that no one would perish. Right. But he cannot force his will on your will. He gives you free will to choose. The Bible, and to give you hope, in Revelation it talks about the saved. There's a multitude which no man can number, the Bible describes it as. Amen? Thank you for that. Yes, there's a multitude which no man can number. So don't think like, oh, my, the odds are stacked against me. No, it is not. The choice is simply yours. There's no middle ground. John was very clear about this. Those who accept Jesus as their Savior have life. Those who don't are dead will suffer eternal death. Making no decision or postponing is like choosing death. There are no more options. We can run through the Bible. Therefore, choose life, Deuteronomy 30, 19. Moving on to Tuesday, two options. Um, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Moses makes no, no, pulls no punches. He, he lays it right out there. It's just simply two options. Now, how people can say that um, predestination, that we are predestined to either be saved or lost, that God made some people to be saved and God made some people to be lost, and we have no choice. We're just robots going through life and whatever our destiny is is our destiny and there's nothing we can do to change about it. But that... There's so much biblical truth right here just in Deuteronomy that shows that that is not biblically accurate at all. The difference between life and death is determined by good and evil. God's offer is quite simple. He offers us one option, good, and therefore life. All through the Bible, we see it. You have life, you have death. You have blessing, you have cursing. You have the sheep, and you have the goat. Is there such a thing as a shoat or a geep? You're either a sheep or you're a goat. There's no in-between. There's no amalgamated sheep-goat thing that you can just go down the middle. Maybe I'll be saved then, lost. I see a hand, yes. Can we give that uh, young man a, a mic? Uh, so you see in the story of Moses, too, that even for the Egyptians, they had a choice, too, to follow what the, what the Israelites were doing, and they could be saved, too. God gave that choice to all people. So it was God's way, and then, you know, there's whatever way you deem fit, so that there's no in-between. <laughs> yeah. So. 
Yeah, you know, God lays out the choices pretty clearly. You know, he gives us a mind to reason and, and wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it liberally, right? So we need wisdom in deciding every little thing. What job will I, what job will I take? I have two job offers. Which ones do I take? Lay it out before the Lord. God will give you the wisdom to understand and, and know what that, what that decision should be. But every day our life is full and wrought with decisions. You are either hot or cold, right? What happens to the lukewarm? Vomited out of the mouth. Vomited out of the mouth, Jesus says, right? You are either saved or lost. You either receive the seal of God or you receive the mark of the beast. You are either a wheat or you are a tear. Is there something in between? No, you're either a wheat or you're a tear. You're either going to be plucked up, bundled together, and set to the fire, or you're going to be gathered together for the harvest, right? It's simple as that. There's no middle ground. There's no in-between. I like the way um, Elijah said it. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Because you can't, you can't straddle the fence. There's no straddling the fence it, it's just two, the two choices. He explained what is good that I command you today to love your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments that you may live. He makes it quite clear. Loving God gives us life. Death is a natural consequence of living apart from him. Lucifer was the first being to choose death. We are all struggling between these two options since then. Therefore, choose life. Deuteronomy 30:19. Any other questions or comments before we move on to Wednesday? Wednesday's lesson was entitled, Not Too Hard for You. Now, people say, and we, we, we talked about this, is it easier to be saved than to be lost? Moses makes it quite, quite clear. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not too hard for thee, neither is it far off. Other translations talk about it. It's not a mystery. It's not too far from you. It's not um, uh, too mysterious for you, nor is it afar off. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14, beginning in verse 12. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over to the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Is it, is it too hard to do? It makes it quite simple. Is it easier to be saved or to be lost? You have to work to be lost. God is going to send his Holy Spirit. He is going to strive long, long and hard with you to get you to repent. We see this throughout the Bible. He oftentimes gives people the choices to choose to repent or to continue in their, in their um, uh, disobedience of him. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. In order to make conscious decisions, we should understand the consequences of each option. Therefore, God explained the consequences of obeying him or disobeying him. He makes it all quite clear. He puts, puts it out there, lays it out on the line in terms of uh, what, they, what their choices were in terms of um, being too hard. On the other hand, making this decision is easy. God has loved us so much that it's easy to love him back and to do what he likes in response. Which is the first and greatest commandment? Why do you have to start there? Right. Can you obey him if you don't love him? Can you keep his commandments if you don't love him? Why does he start with love the Lord your God? Does he say, listen to what I say and do everything I do first? No, he says, love the Lord your God. So the love starts first. Why do we keep his commandments? Is it because we want to earn our way to heaven? No, what's the motivation? Love. Love has to be the motivation. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, because we can't love one another if we don't love God first. That's why he says, love me first. He doesn't say, love your brother and sister, then love me. It doesn't work. Yeah, and Jesus made it quite clear. They asked him, which is the first and the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your brother as you love yourself. No one hated their own soul, but you're supposed to love your brother just as you love yourself. Uh, yes, Dr. Mandel. So we cannot obey his commandments without him helping us. We ourselves, in our own power, cannot do it. As much as God says, obey my commandments, he is also helping us to obey the commandments. 
Yeah, and that's the, that's the power of surrender and surrendering to his will. Each and every day, it's a daily surrender. We have to have less of self and more of him. It's a constant battle. It's a, you, Paul said it. How often did he die? Daily. He says, I die daily. You have to die to self daily. It is not once and done that once you go into that watery baptism, you're set for life, right? That's not how it works. It's a daily recommitment to our life. It's a daily, hourly. We are not safe for even one hour, Sister White said, neglecting prayer. Because the enemy is there as a roaring lion seeking to devour us. So we have to stay close to God in that respect. The decisions to make to, to follow him and to love him, it's also easy to know what God likes. It's no mystery, as has been clearly written in the Bible. Moses puts it quite plainly. He says, you didn't have to go up to heaven and say, oh, bring God's word to us, or go across the sea and bring God's word to us. It's right there. He said, it's written on your hearts. It comes right out of your mouth. We know what God's perfect will is. So why is it hard, so hard to follow it? Why do we have that struggle, like Paul says, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, those things I do. Why is that always the Christian struggle? Yes, Caesar. The times where I wish I didn't have free will. That you wish you didn't have free I, will. And I have free will. You know, yeah. I think it will be a little easier because we struggle with our we struggle with ourselves and in a way part of being a sinner is also being arrogant with the free will. And sometimes we want to take matters into our own hands. Or sometimes we're not trusting enough in God or we're impatient to see the work get, uh, you know, develop. So a lot of times this free will is, for me, it's a battle. You know, the struggle of trying to yield to God and not let myself get in the way. So at times, you know, I got to you know, force myself to step aside and surrender mm. to God's will. Yeah, and that struggle, that human struggle, it's a good thing. We oftentimes look at it as a bad thing. If I walk through life saying that I'm okay, I got everything I need, you know, the pastor made it quite clear with the, church, the message to the church of Laodicea. When you increase with goods and you have need of nothing, you are lost, you're in a lost state because you, you have need of nothing. You don't recognize your need of a savior each and every day. But if we have that constant struggle, that the, the things I used, that, that I ought to do, or I don't do, and that struggle, that's the Holy Spirit wrestling with us, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's a thing that Paul went through, that he says, I have to die daily, because self, the flesh and the spirit are at constant war with each other, right? Which one is going to win out? The flesh or the spirit? Which one is going to win out? How do you ensure that the spirit overtakes the flesh? David? Uh, Troen. Yeah, just, um, we are, left in our, on this planet in the dark. Uh, the condition is to um, stay hand in hand, so to speak, with the Holy Spirit. And to ask every time, every day, every minute, every second, uh, uh, His help uh, and to guide us and to find the light because God is light. And, and, and we, we, in the darkness without him, will, will be, you know, losing every, every hope and everything. Yeah. So that's why life is light. And life can be reached uh, from the dark if we pray constantly. And we ask the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding and to find him and to obey and to follow. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. We talk about the flesh and the spirit. Which one is going to win out? Is going to be the one that you feed. Right? Which one's going to get stronger? The one that you feed. The one that you give the nutrition to. Right? It's, it's, it's a constant war in our, in our minds and in our bodies. And it's, we're in the battlefield. We're in the middle of the great controversy. The, the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Yes. You know, David, I appreciate you saying that. Because too many times we, when we say that, who's going to win the the flesh of the spirit, we automatically have almost succumbed to the thought of the devil, it will be the flesh. Mm. Because we failed, we think we will always fail. Because there's been failures, we can never have victory. And it is important to understand, it's who you choose to feed. Can we have victory over the flesh? 
Certainly, that's what the Bible tells us. But because there's been failures, we can't allow that thought process to begin thinking we will always fail. We'll never be victorious. Flesh always wins. That's the devil putting that defeated mindset into your thinking, and we got to be careful of that. Yeah, and, and we, we spend a thoughtful hour each day at the cross, the sacrifice that Jesus made. We look at his perfect life. The closer we study Jesus' life and his perfect obedience to the law and his sinful, sinless life, that ability is ours. It's right there for the, for the, for the ask. Jesus wants us to surrender to him. Yes, I see a hand in the back. Yes, you know, we, we weren't created like God. We three powers. The lower power, Yes, you will reap what you sow. Those who sow to the flesh will of the flesh, I finished the verse, it, it escapes me, but if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap death. It's going to be death. If you sow to the spirit, right, you read your Bible, you are constantly studying God's word, you commune with other like Christian believers, you pray to God constantly in your constant communion with him, these are the things that will sow to the spirit that you will then, uh, I saw a hand, uh, yes. Uh, great mic. Sure, it's on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so adding to what you just said that the one that we feel feed the most, there's so many people in the church that they come to church, they study the Bible, but there's no changes in his life. So the important thing is not only to feed, but to surrender. By surrendering, God will show us what we need to change in our life. A lot of us are very reluctant to change. We change the things that we want to do, the things that makes us comfortable. But when it comes to Christ and we surrender to him, he will change the way we treat people, the way we speak to people. Because when we constantly are in his presence, our life has to change. So it's not only what we feed ourselves with, but allowing Christ to mold us in his way. Even though in my heart, I may not want to change, but because I love him so much, I'm going to do his work instead yeah. of my work. Yeah. Many of us, we like to call Jesus Savior, but he is our Lord and Savior. Lord means that he has rule over your life. Your life is surrendered to his will. That is what Jesus is. He is our Lord and our Savior. Not just, everybody loves the Savior part. Yes, Jesus, you, you know, you, you died for me, great, I got it. But the Lord part where he has to control your life, where everything is, is in subjection to him, that part we struggle with because it's, we, don't, we don't like that being told what to do and I wanna go my own way, I wanna choose my own path. A question of worship. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day, you shall surely per perish. Worship is the key in the great controversy. God is a jealous God. How is God's jealousy like ours? How is it unlike ours? Yes, yes. God is a jealous God because we worship other gods. He is the only true God. He, he looks at that as being the ultimate, um, almost like, you, I hate to say it, but the slap in the face, basically, to worship other gods. When we worship someone or something else instead of God, we're choosing evil and death. Worship is more than bowing before an image. Um, however, this decision is not reserved to that moment. We must make the decision between worshiping God or leaving him aside. I love this quote from Ellen White. Every soul has a heaven to win and a hell to shun. You got that? It's plain and simple. Choose life. God lays it out quite simply before us. Choose life. There is a heaven to win and a hell to shun. Satan is there waiting to draw many men to his side. Christ is there begging, pleading 
follow me, choose life. Choose the Son, those who choose the Son have life. The power of choice has been given to all of us. Use it, exercise it, but use it towards God's glory. God bless you. Continue to study, my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Elder. I appreciate that. Thank you, church family, for your participation and joining in today. We trust that the Lord will bless you as we continue to worship. We close our service today, and we'll close with a prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful lesson, the book of Deuteronomy, the opportunity to choose. And today, Lord, we want to choose you. So be with us. Be with those viewing online. Pray for our church, family, and friends. Bless as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for being with us. We'll be here next week. God bless. Have a wonderful Sabbath.